you can no longer listen to this radio. Well, you can, because it has AM, FM and shortwave included, but you definitely can't listen to this one, or this one. They have distinctive and unusual antennas that you've probably never seen before. A viewer requested this video a while back, so I picked up a few radios and thought I'd give it a go. These radios were made for the World Space Satellite Radio Service. World Space, later One World Space, designed this system specifically to serve the developing world. It used satellites to broadcast digital audio and multimedia programs directly to compact portable receivers such as this. It operated two satellites and had the capability to easily reach widely dispersed geographic locations and even areas with no telephone connectivity. The extensive reach was further enhanced by alternative power supply solutions that addressed the lack of connectivity to public electrical power grids in certain areas. The aim was ambitious, to change radio from a local medium to a regional and global information system for billions of people. With WorldSpace, broadcasters would be able to deliver programs to a wide geographic area in a variety of levels of audio quality and their capabilities stretched far beyond conventional radio. WorldSpace was founded in 1990 and it's not widely reported but testing for this system began in 1996 when signals were beamed from a helicopter rather than a satellite to a prototype receiver on the ground. Using the helicopter equipped with a special digital transmitter, the engineers tested a variety of characteristics of the system including the effect of elevation levels and angles on reception. In late 1998, the AFRISTAR satellite arrived in geosynchronous orbit at 21 degrees east on November the 3rd and began tests during the first week of New Year 1999. AFRISTAR was one of three satellite delivered digital audio broadcasting services planned by WorldSpace and was the first of three set launches. Asia Star and Ameristar, for services to Asia and Latin America respectively, were scheduled for launch later in 1999 and 2000, with a fourth satellite being constructed as a backup and to provide supplemental services. Ultimately, only Afristar and Asia Star would be launched. The launch capped three and a half years of work by WorldSpace and its partner Alcatel in the development of a three satellite system for delivering high quality digital audio. The tests were conducted not only to make certain that the satellite survived the rigours of launch and made it into its proper orbit, but also to test reception and receiver function in the field before mass production of receivers began. Hitachi, Matsushita or Panasonic, Sanyo and JVC all delivered pre-production versions of their receivers to WorldSpace for the test phase in 1999. After what WorldSpace termed an extensive validation testing process, commercial broadcasts from Afristar to the whole of Africa and the Middle East commenced in October 1999. Eventually, two satellites were in orbit, delivering digital radio to almost all populated regions of the Southern Hemisphere. The second satellite, Asia Star, provided coverage of the Asian continent from China to India and was launched in February 2000. Finally, by the end of the year 2000, the third satellite, Ameristar, was to take up its position over Latin America. Due to rising costs and slow uptake, this didn't happen. Also known as Carib Star and later renamed Afristar 2, this satellite was built but never launched. Asia Star sat at 105 degrees east for Asia and Ameristar would have sat at 95 degrees west for Central and Southern America. The fourth satellite, World Star 4, was also considered, and some components were acquired, however, the whole World Star 4 satellite was never built. Each satellite could downlink three L band beams. Each of the three beams on the satellite provided up to 192 channels of mono audio, 96 channels of stereo audio, 48 channels of stereo music quality audio, 32 channels of near CD quality audio and 24 channels of CD quality audio or a combination of services. The maximum downlink capacity for the satellite was two 1.536 megabits per second streams on each beam. Each spot beam contained two time division multiplexed or TDM carriers centered at different frequencies in the 1452 to 1492 megahertz band. Afristar's western beam operated from approximately 1.476 GHz to 1.482 GHz, with both right and left hand circular polarisation. Circular polarisation differs from the more familiar vertical or horizontal plane polarisation in that the transmitted signal rotates in a corkscrew like manner. This characteristic made positioning of the receiving aerial easier, provided the azimuth and elevation were approximately correct. 
The forward pickup lobe of the aerial supplied for reception was very wide at around 80 degrees. The aerial didn't need to be level in the vertical or horizontal sense, which would not be the case with vertical or horizontal polarisation. Each TDM carried 1.536 megabits per second, divided into 96 prime rate channels or PRCs, 16 kilobits per second each. Every audio program used one broadcast channel or BC, and a BC could use anywhere between 1 to 8 PRCs, depending on the desired audio quality. The world space digital format incorporated interleaving, Reed Solomon and convolution encoding technologies to protect the service against transmission errors. Typically 30 to 40 audio channels were available at any given geographical location. The satellite signal was strong, with an effective isotropic radiated power or EIRP of 53 dBW. Broadcasters linked to the system with much greater ease and far less retooling than you'd expect. No huge infrastructure investments or lengthy setup times were involved. All broadcasters could access the satellite directly in FDMA or Frequency Division Multiple Access Mode in the X-Band at 7.025 GHz to 7.075 GHz from their own individual uplink station. This mode was selected because of the flexibility it delivered when multiple independent uplink stations were being used. In the studio, the broadcaster multiplexed the audio programs and or multimedia services on a broadcast channel. The uplink station split the broadcast channel into prime rate channels, each with a capacity of 16 kilobits per second for transmission to the satellite. The uplink could handle up to 288 prime rate channels. The digital processor on board the satellite demultiplexed and demodulated the prime rate channels at baseband level and converted them to TDM or time division multiplexing for L-band transmission of the signal to listeners. This method enabled several broadcasters to access a hub station, which was capable of broadcasting bundles of programs. The hub station received multiplex broadcasting channels, split them into prime rate channels, then performed the same processing as the digital processor. The TDM signals, a maximum of three, were transmitted in the X-band to the satellite, which converted the frequency and sent the L-band signals to the radio receiver. It took me quite a while to get my head round this, and I hope my explanation and these graphics I put together make sense. To support the world space satellites, Alcatel constructed ground systems on five continents. The ground control system featured telemetry command and ranging stations, or TCRs, communications system monitoring equipment, or CSMEs, and regional operations control centres, or ROCCs. The TCR and CSME stations provided commands and controls to facilitate broadcasting in conjunction with the regional operations control centres. The CSM facilities were located in Lieberville, Gabon, and Johannesburg, South Africa for Afristar, and Melbourne, Australia for Asiastar. Telemetry Command and Ranging, or TCR ground stations, consisted of an X-band uplink command and control system and an L-band telemetry monitoring system. The feeder link stations were used by broadcasters or content providers to feed the satellites with the programming they needed to entertain and inform those parts of the world. The ROCCs controlled the broadcast operations. This network allowed for quality control over all aspects of the broadcasting chain. When a broadcaster sent its signal to the satellite, feedback was available to ensure proper allocation of system resources and to block unwanted transmissions. The regional operation centres for the satellites were located in Silver Spring, Maryland in the USA for Afristar and Melbourne, Australia for Asiastar. World Space Satellite Radio was inherently a digital broadcast medium and could be tailored to provide a variety of one-way, one-to-many types of data services, expanding the range of services far beyond traditional radio. Multicasting, namely the distribution of digital content simultaneously to a closed user group or CUG in multiple locations, and live lectures based on PowerPoint presentations with the possibility of real-time annotations were two of the main possibilities. Multicasting is the distribution of content simultaneously to multiple locations. The IP multicasting solution of WorldSpace provided a web-like user interface to upload the content to the uplink site and set up the transmission. The recipients of this information were individually addressable. Of course, the radio couldn't do all of the work, so a world space receiver connected to a personal computer acted like a wireless modem, capable of downloading several megabytes of data every hour. 
For the data transmissions, a broadcast channel of 128 kilobits per second was used, and the bit rate was allocated on this channel dynamically, allowing several closed user groups to share the channel. The company also maintained a not-for-profit arm, using 5% of the satellite's bandwidth to broadcast programs giving advice on HIV and AIDS, agriculture, and providing information for women. Programming on the whole was a combination of news, sports, music, brand name content, and educational output. Even Radio Caroline looked to broadcast via Afristar on Worldspace, which did cover most of the UK and continental Europe. Transmissions began on July 22, 2002. Due to the digital transmission method used, the receiver technology had to be completely newly developed. The Worldspace radios differed significantly in terms of both constructional design and function from conventional radios. The first striking feature is the antenna, which, just as big as the palm of a hand, had only to point roughly in the direction of the satellite. Fifteen months after the first chipsets for proprietary world space receivers were developed, four receiver manufacturers unveiled their first production units in December 1998. Representatives from Hitachi, JVC, Matsushita, which was Panasonic, and Sanyo showed the first digital satellite radio receivers at World Space headquarters in Washington. The JVC FRDS100 and the Hitachi KHWS1 were amongst the earliest world space receivers with added AM and FM functionality. Panasonic's RWWS10 and Sanyo's DSB WS1000 were designated world space only receivers. The receivers cost between $250 and $350 at launch, depending upon the manufacturer, model, and local import tariffs. The price was anticipated to decrease as more receivers were sold. Worldspace expected 500,000 receivers to be sold during its first year of operation. They believe there to be 200 to 250 million households in the service areas that could afford receivers at the initial price. This figure was based on the number of households in Africa, the Middle East, Asia and Latin America that own satellite television dishes, VCRs and other home electronics. Although the four launch receivers sported different features and capabilities, they all provided full access to the World Space Satellite delivered digital programming and could be powered by AC power or DC batteries. Each receiver included a program selection process that allowed users to search for programming based on language and program type. Users could select a number of presets to return to their favourite channels. The receivers included an LCD screen to display the program name and other information, as well as a data in and out port for connection to a PC, allowing users to take advantage of future satellite-delivered multimedia and data services. Each receiver was individually addressable, allowing for the future introduction of subscription-based audio and multimedia services. Because the units were receiving a satellite-based signal, reception required a line-of-sight path to the sky. Therefore, the antenna on each of the receivers was detachable and could be placed 10 to 16.5 feet from the receiver. This distance could be extended to up to 33 feet with an additional cable with next to no signal loss. Different end-user antennas such as a palm-sized patch antenna or a short or long Yagi antenna could be used to receive the services. Although the World Space system operated in the L-band, there were no concerns about possible conflicts with Eureka 147 DAB, which also operated in the band. World Space and Eureka 147 operated at different ends of the L-band, and both groups worked with the International Telecommunications Union Frequency Regulation Committees to ensure that there were no conflicts. The biggest problem was actually with existing terrestrial microwave links, and World Space developed filters in the receivers to handle this problem. The signal was also easily interrupted by concrete, glass, trees and even smoke. Revenue flowed to world space through leased capacity on the satellites, licensing revenue from the sale of receivers, advertising on world space developed programming and other content. World space was considering the possibility of including subscription channel and multimedia pay services in the programming offering mix very early on. By 2004, they'd started moving their business model to subscriptions and aimed to achieve 75-80% to paid revenue. At one time, the service was free to most buyers of receivers. The firm sought revenue by leasing its capacity and selling a combination of ads, receivers and some subscriptions. But by 2000, this model was clearly suffering and Worldspace realised that the fastest route to profitability was subscriptions. Worldspace planned paid services in four targeted areas, India, China, Southern Africa and the Middle East. Eventually it hoped to add Europe. 
After conducting a soft launch in India, it gained 20,000 subscribers very quickly. The service was offered for an introductory price of $3 per month, which would eventually increase to about $5. After India, Worldspace targeted China and hoped that within 2 to 3 years it would have 2 to 3 million subscribers. The services included 16 channels of unique, new content, including 13 music channels, a long-form news programme and children's programming. Programming deals featured 5-10 to 10 channels with the international brand name programming such as Bloomberg Business News and CNN International. Additionally, 5-15 to 15 channels highlighted regionally known broadcasters such as Radio Sud of Senegal. There were also 5-10 to 10 channels that included unique regional content such as Africa Information Service and 5-10 to 10 channels dedicated to national broadcasters such as the Kenya Broadcasting Service. The remaining five channels were devoted to developmental programming from the World Space Foundation, using digital radio to provide health, development and educational programs to the developing world. The end goal for maximum profitability was 5 million subscribers, but slow uptake, changing revenue models, substantial capital costs, the limited lifespan of the satellites themselves and unpredictable political considerations were all obstacles in the way. By 2004, Worldspace had spent $1.4 billion and needed 2 to 2.5 million subscribers by 2005 just to break even, and during this time, they wouldn't reveal the current number of subscribers, which was concerning. Worldspace wanted to sell 1 million receivers by 2001, and it wasn't looking like this had happened. By 2005, a yearly subscription of £76 was required to access encoded stations, and if you had a second radio, the cost would be £49.35, a total of £125.35. Unfortunately, Worldspace was unsustainable as a business, and went into liquidation in 2008. It recorded a $36 million net loss in the second quarter of 2008, as compared to a net loss of £51.2 million in the second quarter of 2007. Throughout 2008 and 2009, the company was in deep debt and was reported to owe its creditors over $50 million, due to be paid by various repeatedly postponed deadlines. The problems with Worldspace were familiar to those following Digital Radio Mondial or DRM Shortwave at this time. The receivers were expensive, especially in the developing countries within the Worldspace footprints. The radios that were portable suffered with high battery consumption too. Worldspace peaked at 170,000 subscribers in Eastern, Southern and Northern Africa, the Middle East and much of Asia that access services solely via its satellites. Some sources claim that 150,000 of these subscribers were in India. In India, 450,000 additional subscribers accessed Worldspace mainly via satellite television services or the internet. That's a pitifully small subscriber base to pay back the investment in the two Worldspace satellites in orbit. In a last-ditch but ultimately completely unsuccessful effort to avoid commercial insolvency in July 2008, Worldspace changed its brand and corporate identity to One Worldspace. Before filing for bankruptcy in October 2008, One Worldspace employed two satellites and broadcast 62 channels, 38 of which were content provided by international, national and regional third parties, and 21 Worldspace branded stations produced by or for One Worldspace. Most of the channels were available only through a subscription plan. The two operational satellites that the company had, Afristar and Dejastar, are now being used by their new owner, the Yamsi USA LLC, run by Worldspace's Noah Samara. The company claims to have built the first satellite-to-tablet content delivery system. The system primarily aims at providing educational services to rural areas in developing countries. The first pilots of the technology are said to be taking place in India, with 30,000 licenses, and the sub-Saharan region in Africa, with the latest trials in two schools in South Africa, in Mpumalanga province, and in Heathfield in Western Cape. So, that's the rise and fall of World Space Satellite Radio. Thank you.